now is Raul Ruparal. He's head of economic research at Open University. Raul, welcome to the programme. Um, all this talk of tougher sanctions, I mean, is there any evidence to suggest that the sanctions already in place are having any effect whatsoever? Well, I think we are seeing some economic effects. We've seen large capital outflows from Russia, a lot of volatility in the ruble and the stock markets. And um, we've also seen uh, indirect effects of people just being hesitant to invest and do business with Russian firms. That being said, on the political side, you know, it doesn't really seem to have had much in eastern Ukraine. We have seen some talk of de-escalation, but periodically it's been ramped up over the past few months. So I think there is a question to be asked about what effect these have had so far. What is the purpose of sanctions? We hear a lot of talk about it, but in this case, is it to drive division between the political factions there, or is it simply to push Russia into a corner financially, whereby it has no other option but to comply? Well, I think this is one of the issues with the EU sanctions. It's not exactly clear what their goals are. In the very short term, they want to try and secure Ukraine, they want to get the MH17 investigation going, or those were the original goals. But in the medium to long term, it's not clear exactly what relationship they want to have with Russia and Ukraine, and what these sanctions are trying to achieve. They do want to clearly push Russia away to an extent, but ultimately, given the gas ties and the economic ties between Europe and Russia, in the longer term, I'm not sure they can really afford this huge division, and they haven't really tackled the issue of how to deal with that. When speaking of affordability, I mean, sanctions are a long-term gain. You've mm -hmm. got to be in it for the long term if they're going to have any effect whatsoever, but clearly the concern also is the effect that it can have on the countries imposing these sanctions. Mm -hmm. Can they do this for as long as is needed to make Russia comply? Well, I think that really depends which sanctions they go for. At the moment, the energy sector seems to be off the table, particularly gas, so that will limit the long-term effect. I think if you look at the long-term economic prosperity in Europe compared to Russia, it is much more secure in Europe, despite the Eurozone crisis. Uh, Russia has a lot of demographic problems. Its growth has been hit. They have a lot of volatility, as I said, in the stock market and the currency. So that means in the long term, it may struggle to deal with sanctions, even though it has this cash buffer that you mentioned earlier of foreign exchange reserves. So in the long term, Europe may in a be in a slightly healthier position to deal with the sanctions, but uh, it would also drive divisions because it wouldn't hit all countries equally. You know, we see a lot of the eastern states have uh, very close ties to Russia and they're being hit very hard by the sanctions already and they will get uh, worse as the longer it goes on. So um, this division would make it even harder to sustain, obviously, because you need unanimous support for these kinds of... Now, briefly for us, if these sanctions fail to have much effect, are there any other options at their disposal? What else can you do to ratchet up the pressure on Russia? Well, there are further sanctions they could take. There's obviously been talk of uh, limiting Russian access to the SWIFT banking system, which would uh, essentially cut it off from their global financial system. That's something the UK has pushed for. There's more cultural and political sanctions. We've heard talk of banning them from hosting the 2018 World Cup. But if the sanctions themselves aren't working, um, there isn't really many other options. They have applied huge political pressure. They clearly don't want to go down the military route. So beyond that, I think Europe and, and the US are struggling to know exactly how to deal with the situation. And that's the crux of the problem, really. OK, one for us to watch, certainly, Raoul Rupert. Thanks very much, uh, Raoul, there from Open Europe. Now, that conflict in Ukraine has pushed the Russian ruble to a series of record lows against the dollar as investors worry about the prospects of new Western sanctions against the country. This follows steep falls in the ruble and Russian stocks last week after Western governments secured Russia of direct military intervention in eastern Ukraine. Now, the tumbling currency is posing further problems for the Russian economy, as Jeremy Howell now reports. In the past few days, pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine have stepped up their offensive, forcing back government troops around Luhansk and Donetsk. NATO warns at least a thousand Russian troops have crossed the border to join them. In Russia, the escalation of the conflict has been mirrored by a run on the currency. The ruble-dollar exchange rate has risen over the past week from 35 and a half rubles to the dollar to over 37 rubles to the dollar. Investors have been selling off ruble-based assets, worried the European Union will soon introduce much tougher sanctions against Russia. It's quite likely that by the end of this week, um, the European Union will decide that one of the measures that they will take against Russia is to ban buying Russian sovereign paper means that uh, the Russian government will, uh, will be cut off from the, its previous um, access to capital markets. It means that uh, the uh, investors who already hold Russian uh, bonds will be quite worried and they will try to ditch those. The falling ruble is hurting the economy. It means Russia gets less for the oil and gas it exports. And it means imported goods are more expensive to buy. 
The inflation rate in Russia is now over 9%. As I receive my salary in rubles, of course there's been a substantial rise in prices. When you go abroad, the rising exchange rate affects the budget of the trip. So I think it has an influence on ordinary people. The central bank is coming under pressure to raise interest rates to force down inflation. But that would make credit more expensive for households and industry and might push Russia's already stagnating economy into recession. Jeremy Howell, BBC News. Just time to show you some market numbers because, of course, the impact of events in Japan are really uh, filtering through to the numbers. The Nikkei at one point hitting a seven-month high, such was the speculation of that reshuffle in the uh, cabinet over in Japan. In China, we've had good figures for the service sector, making up for those poor figures for manufacturing. That's all your business. I'll see you soon. Switch to Vonage Home Phone Service, and you just might be surprised at what you get. Like unlimited nationwide or international calling for an unexpected price, and over 25 knock your socks off calling features. Plus, for a limited time, get our free whole house kit, a Vonage adapter, and three phones, a jaw-dropping $90 value. It's the final days to get a free whole house kit with your unlimited nationwide or international calling plan. Hurry, call or click before this offer ends. Extreme weather is having a direct impact on the business bottom line. The drought in Sri Lanka and Australia pushed up the price of tea and beef. 90% of the world's farmers live in the developing world. If they're in an unaffected region, then the value of the